This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. You're listening to Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Hello and welcome to The Edge, Trek FM show about Star Trek Discovery. I'm Mike and Brandon will be hosting a feature presentation tonight in which he discusses Despite Yourself with a couple of uh, other hosts from the network. But before we get into that, we have a little bit of news. And joining me to discuss this news is my favorite co-host from Stage 9, John (laughs) Mills. How's it going, John? Hey, I feel confident. I'm happy. I, I reached the top of that heap finally. Finally! Is this your first time on The Edge? Yeah, I think so. It is. It's my first time on The Edge. Yeah. Hey, so with all of the hoopla of the you know season starting back up and all this stuff, one of the things which, I don't know, maybe has kind of sort of been buried is that um, the TCAs are going on right now, which is there ever a time that the TCAs are not going on? I mean, these things seem to last for like, 15 weeks and they seem to do them like three times a year they're just always going i don't get it i don't understand but i'm okay with it because you know whatever it's new news and it gives like television people a platform to discuss what they're doing behind the scenes and all that stuff and cbs all access i guess uh did their little thing and gretchen berg and aaron harberts were uh around to discuss uh A lot of stuff about uh, Star Trek Discovery, but um, one thing in particular was basically what their approach to season two is going to be. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, hey, maybe we're getting a little ahead of things, but, you know, that's what we do (laughs) as Star Trek fans. fans. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, there were a couple things. There's, There's one quote from Aaron Harberts, which was, rather interesting you know i mean they discussed the sort of like tumultuous path to get you know season one to the screen and he basically said you know with season two it's going to be different he says this year we have a fantastic creative team in place everyone knows each other although there are some additions as we noted on uh, stage nine uh which which drops today but we also have time this year we have time to do things like more away missions newer planets These are stories that might fall a little bit more into the framework of allegory that people love from Star Trek. Now, that's interesting because when he's talking about having more time this year, that almost makes it sound like there's going to be more episodes this year. I I would contest that he means that they have more time to actually do like we all know about the background of, you know, season one's Rocky Road to to uh, launch and everything like that. I think that he probably means they have more runway before launch this time where they, they actually have the time to just say, this is what season two is going to be as opposed to with season one, it was, you know, going a certain way. And then partway through the process, they said no. And now you have this much time and you have to turn it around. So I think probably he's referring to more setup time. Although I'd be, tickled pink to be wrong and find out that it's going to be more episodes that'd be cool i mean what you're saying makes sense and i think if he hadn't specified you know more time to do things like away missions and newer planets like then i would have like that's the thing it's like i mean you know did you not have i mean is i don't know 
Maybe he just <laughs> means that this, th- with this season setting everybody up, they don't have to spend so much time obsessed with setup. Oh, yeah, they can true. actually that's just true. do things because they don't have to explain about threat ganglia and you know betrayals and wars and stuff like that. They can just. We all know that it's a given, and I mean, honestly, for me, that quote almost sounds like they're saying that the war is going to be over. Oh, they flat out said that. And okay, they flat said, out said they that. They flat okay. out said it again here. You know, that's one of those things, uh, like with you know this whole Colbert thing, where they seem to want to get that up front real quick because, you know, the the perception of of Star Trek over the years has been that it's about peace, you know, not war. And, you know, any time that they sort of dive into a war scenario, there's always some pushback from the fans and saying like, hey, this is not the optimistic future that Gene Roddenberry promised us. Why are we watching a war show? And, you know, from the very beginning, they were like, you know, this is about how we're getting to Roddenberry's future. The war, you know, is only going to last one season. It's not going to be, you know, the entire series. Season two will not be a war show, you know. Hmm. So uh, that that's, I, uh, yeah. I, I guess I'd always figured, I, I mean, that, that makes, yes, that makes sense. I guess I'd always figured in the back of my mind that it was going to be something where it was like, th- there was no real quote unquote end to the war. It's sort of like the Korean War where mm-hmm. technically we all think of the war is over, but the war is still going on, and every so often there's some tension and, and stuff like that. So it's you know sort of like a constant state. But you know that either way, it means we're going to be moving into, like you said, something that's a little bit more expected of of the type of trek that we are expecting. Yeah, and, and it does sound like it's going to be more episodic. But like he says here, but we will always continue to have that overarching serialized thread. So, I mean, that's kind of what they did early on in this season. You know, I, mm-hmm. I feel like they're getting, you know, like if you look at it now, well, we have, you know, three episodes now which have led one right into the other. And the next episode, it certainly looks like will be, you know, part four in this particular, you know, mini arc or sub arc or whatever you want to call it. But it, it seems like we're going to get maybe a few more standalone uh, episodes next year, which is cool. And, you know, it, it goes on to say that, you know, in terms of like thematic elements, you know, what what they're they're looking to, to sort of like tackle. And of course, you know, the who knows, because I mean, they're talking in, in very general terms. Yeah. But Harbert's uh, said that they want to explore faith and science versus faith, uh, which, again, is a, a very Star Trek thing to do, you yeah. know, Um it's something which has sort of been built into the show from the beginning. So I, I think that that's, I mean, that can be fascinating. You know? Well, I think it'll be interesting because it'll be a reflection of where the conversation is now. You know, because you can, you go through each series and you see where the, the cultural conversation is at that point in time uh, with regards to things. And so I think it'll be interesting to see where these writers think the conversation is you know, in in terms of that science versus faith sort of thing, because that, you know, that's still, I mean, it's a conversation that, you know, has been going on for quite a long time and I don't think will ever be resolved. So this is really just another chance to get that snapshot to see where it stands now. Yeah. Which I think is good, you know, because I mean, that's what Star Trek is. It's a kind of a snapshot of the times that we're living in, you know, yeah. throughout history. And I mean, obviously, it's also kind of a snapshot of whoever it is who's making the show at that particular time. I mean, you, you look at, uh, you know, seasons three and four of Enterprise, and they're very different from, you know, seasons, you know, three and four of Next Generation or whatever, right. because the people making them, you know, had definitely, you know, different, you know, sort of like philosophical viewpoints or whatever. And, you know, I mean, just, I mean... I don't know what what the the thinking is, you know, with with the current creators. Although, you know, I, w- I will note that you know on Aaron and Harberts' uh, Twitter bio, you know, he does say that he's the son of a preacher man. So, yeah. Then again, I'm the son of a preacher man, and I'm as atheist as they come. So I guess that doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I, You know, I, I would say it probably means that uh, it's a conversation that he's familiar enough 
with himself that like i i think that you know he will bring i mean and not just him but the other writers i mean i'm i'm fascinated again just to see because people can't avoid but put their own personal experiences in so you'll get a flavor for the many different ways they can reach many similar or different conclusions you know and will they feel any sort of pressure because i i mean if anything like if you go back into if you go to TOS, right, there's a sort of with those those cultural conversations, there's almost like this external pressure that you have to resolve it a certain way for everybody to be like, okay, well, you did your allegory and now we're going back and let's wrap it up. Next Generation pushed a little bit harder, but there was still that driving force of like, nobody has a problem with anybody's beliefs ever and everybody believes different things. Then you have DS9, which is, you know... I'm working with you because I have to, but your beliefs are off the rails, you yeah. know, which, which, you know, to a certain cynical segment of me is like, yeah, that's sort of how it works. Uh, and that, but then you have, you know, Voyager, we're all trapped here. We don't have the luxury of having a problem with our beliefs. And then enterprise, of course, is, you know, go back to the beginning and we're all just learning about our beliefs with each other. So I think that discovery, it's going to be a very interesting what is their point of attack for those conversations? Yeah, because, I mean, with the characters that are in place now, I don't really see, you know, you don't have, like, there are times, you know, like with Deep Space Nine, you have Kira, for example, who's like mm-hmm. a spiritual character who sort of like naturally, you know, lends, uh, you know, a, a certain perspective which would allow for this conversation to exist like, well, I was going to say we don't have that, but we do have that because we have the Klingons, right? So mm-hmm. we do have that that perspective. Um, but, you know, it'll be interesting to see, like, like how how it is they, they do choose to sort of, like, get into these stories. And I imagine it will be through various ways, although it sounds like this, I mean, the fact that he calls this out, right, it, 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 at this early stage makes me think that whatever that overarching storyline is will somehow be based on this concept. So yeah. it's interesting. I'm excited, so. you know? Yeah. I mean, it's cool that, I mean, you know, it, looking at, you know, sort of like well, war, I mean, the Klingon war, you know, definitely is sort of an allegory for our times right now. And, and uh, you know, there, there's there's definitely other, like I, I love it for that, but there are definitely other elements of society which are worthy of, exploration and yeah i i think that it's cool that they're choosing to sort of like pick a different topic or whatever for their for their you know serialized story next season which only makes sense but it's cool that they're doing it still i'm with you yeah. absolutely all right well enough of uh the future let's let's go to the it's the the mirror, the mirror, and let's toss this over to uh, Brandon and company to talk about season one, episode ten, despite yourself. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that introduction. And my name is Brandon Shamatella, and I'm your host for tonight's discussion on the second half of the first season premiere for Star Trek Discovery entitled Despite Yourself. And we've got two wonderful co-hosts of Trek FM shows joining us tonight. Uh, Joining us, uh, Suzanne, is this your first time on The Edge? This is my first time on The Edge. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, that's so exciting. Welcome, Suzanne, co-host of To The Journey. And also joining us is Guinevere Nell, who is co-host of The Briar Patch, a socioeconomic podcast here on Trek FM. How are you doing, Guinevere? Yeah, I'm great. And it's my first time on The Edge, and it's exciting to be on, like, the cool show, <laughs> the super cool show. <laughs> <laughs> Word, yeah, we're real cool here. We, uh, we, we flip up our collars here, and... Uh, you know, I think it's a pretty good place. I think it's a pretty fun place to be. So, uh, excellent. Well, we're going to jump right into our discussion here right away. And first impressions that I want to ask you guys um, is stay away from the palace. Stay away from the palace. Oh, Where is this I palace? <laughs> I totally think it's like the Imperial Palace that's going to be on Earth somewhere. That's what I'm thinking. It's like, don't go to the palace. They're going to have to do some secret mission to go off and 
and kill Georgiou. I don't know, that's who I'm thinking the Emperor is, and we're just speculating now, but it's going to be the Imperial Palace. That's what I'm thinking. That would so. be amazing if she was the Emperor. <laughs> but then technically, yeah, wouldn't totally she be the jumping. Empress? That, that's the, that's the uh, gender-neutral uh, futuristic term. Okay. And they're using it to confuse us and to try and make us not think that uh, Ash Tyler is Vogue, which we already figured out. <laughs> oh, that's another topic. Up there. So, we're just all over the place tonight. Yeah, um, it's so funny that you said that because um, I was thinking it was just referring to like um, to you know stay away from the mind you know that is actually Klingon and you know like the palace, like the cathedral, you know, kind of metaphor thing. But my husband said exactly the same thing that you said, that Georgia is the empress and that the palace is like her imperial palace or whatever. Yeah, it's got to be. I think they're hitting the nail right on the head with that one. Well, I hope there's a moat. But, there has to be a moat. <laughs> if you got a palace, a you have to have a moat. Moat filled with fortune cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and tribbles. Yes, so true. where I want to start with this is we're going to start right off the bat talking about the mirror universe. Um, now, uh, Suzanne, you're you're primarily for our uh, To the Journey, which is our Star Trek Voyager podcast. Yes. And Guinevere, you're kind of all over the place for podcasts. You, you, you approach topics from everywhere. How familiar are you two with the Mirror Universe? Guinevere, we'll start with you. Um, well, I'm ex- I've experienced every um, incarnation of it, I guess. Um, I've certainly, you know, I, I'm not as big on um, TOS as some people are, but I've definitely seen the Mirror Universe episodes. Um, I love it in the Enterprise, and I love how we saw those um, torture booths again in this. And so I can see definitely the connection between Enterprise era and um, Discovery era. And then um, I guess uh, it's popped up in – where else has it popped up? We've had it on Deep Space Nine significantly. There oh, was, yeah, of course. I think it was five episodes that dealt with the Mirror Universe, four where we actually were, and then one where Burial came over to our side. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, and I do know those episodes well. I'm a, I'm a big Deep Space Nine fan, so... Um, yeah, I guess it just didn't pop into my head straight away because it feels a little different in Deep Space Nine, doesn't it? And a lot of stuff has changed by then. And I do know the history, you know, how Spock changed everything um, in the Mirror Universe. And the history is really interesting, and I think they're, you know, they're keeping to it quite well, keeping us, you know, keeping that history becoming more, you know, like uh, deepening it. Mm-hmm. Right? So it- – Suzanne, as somebody who's not whose primary show isn't the original series, how do you mm-hmm. think they've they've dealt with it here? Do you think that they've kept it true? I I think so. Um, I'm more familiar with the original series Mirror Universe episode and um, the TNG Mirror Universe comics. Mm-hmm. So they've they've like been the new keep, ones? yeah they've been mm-hmm. pretty much keeping with the whole grain of Mirror Universe with some differences here and there. But you still get that that general dark, menacing feel. Okay, yeah. Now, going into this episode, I want to know, it was spoiled before the show even started. Jonathan Frakes had made a comment that they would be traveling to the Mirror Universe. So, so we were expecting this episode to be a Mirror Universe episode. And leading up to this, except for the very ending of episode 9... I don't think that there was any indication, in hindsight, now that we know that this is the Mirror Universe episode, I don't think there's any indication in the first eight episodes of the series that we would end up in the Mirror Universe. And, you know, I'm I'm a little upset that we had that spoiler because it really colored a lot of the perceptions of the show and what our expectations were. So what do you guys think about that? What do you think, Suzanne? I actually liked the little spoiler. It, it, It gave me hope. I was like, yes, there's a mirror coming, mirror coming, yay. So I was Mm -hmm. actively looking forward to it, and I'm like counting down which one's it going to be. Okay, okay, we're here. And I thought it was just going to end up being one episode. And I'm thrilled to find out it's more than one. So we get to delve deeper into the Terran Empire and Captain Tilly. A little bit of a mini arc or something like that. Uh, Guinevere, what do you think? Did you know about the spoiler ahead of time? Had you heard that? I did, and the spoiler that I heard also um, indicated that it would be more than one episode. 
So I kind of already knew that. And yeah, I sort of agree with the idea that like it might have been more impactful. It might have been more exciting if we didn't have that spoiler. And I guess not every fan had that spoiler. Um, Right. But at the same time, like because, you know, we knew that there was this that the um, spores were connecting to all universes and you could sort of start to think about, well, does that mean that it's connecting to the mirror universe? It also got us kind of speculating on what that means and whether like Captain Lorca, because he has this bit of a dark side might actually be from the mirror universe. Um, and was, you know, in a sense, maybe was trying to like get back there on purpose. And that's why he wanted to do all of those jumps. And I think that speculation was a lot of fun. And now we can still continue to speculate as they're in the mirror universe and see whether he is actually, does he have like a secret plan? You know, is that why he wants to stay there a little bit longer than, you know, some of the, everyone was thinking like, you know, let's, let's hurry up and get back. And he said, well, we have to kind of settle in and, you know, make sure that, you know, we don't spoil anything, you know, that everyone believes that, you know, who we are before we go back. He sort of wanted to take his time a little bit. I can't remember exactly what he said. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of, it's interesting, the speculation there, because there might be like more to it than we know so far. Do you know what I mean? And I also like one hint that maybe Captain Lorca was planning this is, you know, when um, he told Burnham that it was too dangerous for her to go onto the Klingon ship. There was no reason. I mean, you know, it's not like at that, you know, like, oh, it's too dangerous because you're a woman. That's not how they treat female Starfleet officers. So why is it too dangerous for her when she was brought on? She was a criminal. She was brought on because of the war onto his ship. You know, why was he saying, oh, it's too dangerous? This is in the episode before. Why is it too dangerous for her to go onto the Klingon ship? And I'm thinking maybe that's because he knew of her importance in the mirror universe once he set up his plan and got the spore drive and interrupted it and got them to go to the mirror universe. Then mm-hmm. he needed her there because she was the one who was going to be, you know, bring him back in the, in the way that it played out. See, that's possible, but watching this episode, I'm not getting the impression that Lorca is from the Mirror Universe. I believe that he took them there on purpose because, again, I had written down a comment. I didn't write down the quote, but when they're when they're in his ready room and they're looking at that map and they're talking about it and the camera's panning around them, mm-hmm. Burnham asks, she says, you know, we should look at the logs. And as soon as she says that, Lorca shuts down the map and says, you know, we don't need to do that. The problem here was Stamets and we pushed Stamets too hard. And he really deflects the attention away from Mm -hmm. the logs immediately. And knowing that, like there is an image online that at the end of episode nine, uh, Lorca, there is an override that was pushed into the, the, the system on his pad. And there's a yellow line that says override Lorca G and, uh, so I I have no doubt that he brought them there on purpose, but I'm not getting the impression that he was from the mirror universe because he he didn't really seem to know how things were working. And I mean, he could have seriously messed it up had he answered that hail like he was he seemed to be planning. Uh-huh. And oh, we find out it's actually Captain Killy, right? Which which I absolutely love. I think she's great, <laughs> but. Burnham, fortunately, the logical person is like, hold on a second. We don't know who we are in this universe. Guess what? You're not actually the captain. So to me, watching this episode, I don't get the impression that he's from the Mirror Universe. And I don't know. That's just me. That's what I'm thinking. Suzanne, what do you think? Do you think Lorca is from the Mirror Universe or just wanted to explore or what? I don't think he's from the Mirror Universe. I do do think he wanted to explore and possibly bring back his crew that he lost. But unfortunately, mm. he can't do that either because they're gone oh. there as well. Oh, wow. Because, yeah, Lorca, they find out that Lorca was in command of the, what is it, the Bran, I think it's called, uh, on this universe as well. Um, but that'd be interesting if he thinks that there's a duplicate of everybody and wants to bring him back. Mm-hmm. So, ooh, ooh, I like that, Suzanne. That's good. Yeah, That's interesting. I was thinking, yeah, if he's not from the mirror universe, at least he seemed to have like some reason why he wanted to go there. Maybe just some uh, task that he wanted to complete. I hadn't thought of that one. That's a good one. Hmm. Now, uh, in the notes from the edge, I think it was episode number eight. Uh, Christopher Jones came up with a theory that it might possibly be 
not the mirror universe, but another mirror universe that we've been in the whole time. And they've mm-hmm. actually jumped into our universe. And, you know, so a lot of people were speculating, were they going to be doing the mirror universe? And it turns out here, like from everything that I'm seeing, this is the mirror universe that we have come to know throughout the original series Enterprise and DS9. Are you guys getting that impression as well? Yes, definitely. Yeah. A few people have mentioned that because like the earth symbol is different then it can't be the same it must be another different one but i'm just chalking that up to the design differences with modern day storytelling right Mm -hmm. i'm getting the distinct impression that this is the mirror universe that we've come to know yeah i think it's close enough and also you know designs change subtly over the years and stuff and you know it's a few years i mean it's quite i guess it's quite a few years after enterprise and a few years before tos right so Right. I mean, things change subtly over time, but they have still the pain booths and all of the, the remnants mm-hmm. of the Enterprise era Terran Empire. So to me, it looks the same. Well, yeah, they, they're they're called agony booths, and they even had that in the original Star Trek series because my daughter and I watched Mirror Mirror last night because um, I'm like, okay, they, they're strong indication that it's going to be a Mirror Universe, <laughs> and my daughter doesn't really know Star Trek, so I better show her what the Mirror Universe is so that if it's revealed, then she's mm-hmm. going to have some kind of understanding. And yeah, Chekhov gets tossed into an agony booth in that episode as well. So, uh, But yeah, this is definitely a little bit more painful looking than uh, than Walter Koenig made it look. <laughs> oh yeah, a lot more painful. <laughs> so... Um, anyways, one of the things that I thought that was really cool for Easter eggs was the Defiant and seeing the Defiant. You know, I I love the Tholian Web, which is the original Star Trek series episode where we got introduced to the Defiant. Mm -hmm. And I really love what they did in Enterprise to bring it over and and to do the Mirror Universe episode that they did. I think that's really fascinating. I think that's really creative. And I love that I saw it in this episode. Uh, And the first thing I, I turned to my wife and I'm like, are we going to see the Tholians? <laughs> yeah! Because I love the Tholians. I totally want to see the Tholians. This is going to be awesome if we do get a chance to see the Mirror Tholians again. But, anywho. Uh, was there anything in particular that really got your guys' juices flowing while watching this, Guinevere? Um, yeah, I mean, there were so many things. Um, I mean, I, I'm really looking forward to finding out um, whether... Um, Tyler's, uh, you know, it, it seems like the fan speculation that he's like actually Klingon and that they've overlaid this personality is starting to come true. But the way yeah. that they're doing it, and then the shocking, um, spoiler alert, everyone's obviously seen it already, but you know, that that <laughs> shocking, um, kill of, um, the wonderful doctor. I, I wonder if there's any way that, you know, he can be brought back somehow, or, mm-hmm. you know, if we, meet his mirror self or I don't know. I mean, that's just, you don't, you're not expecting to lose, you know, a character that you love. And then, you know, of course, um, you know, his, his boyfriend, who's, you know, the hero of, of this whole thing and who's, you know, been telling, you know, who's been bringing, um, all of the, the clues out about, you know, the palace and about there's an enemy aboard and all of this. And he's, you know, he looks like he's at the edge of death And that's a little, it's a little shocking that, you know, the first gay characters as well are kind of both almost, you know, looking like they're getting killed off in the first series. Um, I hope that's not true. And, but it's very interesting. I mean, you know, it's, it's laying the foundation for something that's like kind of deeper and more interesting than I expected. Mm Mm-hmm. See, okay. So yeah, we got a lot to unpack there. We got a couple of topics that I want to hit and, uh, um, I think let, let's talk about Voke and uh, Voke and Tyler first. Okay, so I think it's it's clear to me that they've just revealed that mm-hmm. Ash Tyler is Voke. So Voke is the albino Klingon for the listeners that aren't as crazy into it as we are. So Voke is the albino Klingon that we saw in the first four episodes, and we haven't seen since episode four. And I mean, like I've I've watched these episodes several times, and when when the, she starts chanting that prayer and he starts talking in Klingon, it's the same voice. And everything yes. like this is him. Like it's been revealed to me that he is he is Volk. And I gotta say, expecting that resolution to come out, that scene still gave me the creeps watching it, and it was done so well. And I loved hearing that voice come out of his throat. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. So n- expecting this reveal, did the reveal work to you guys, Suzanne? 
Oh, it it really worked, and not in the way I was expecting. I, I, I expected him to fully come out, and when he didn't, and the look on Laurel's face as he's walking away, and she's like, this is not how this was supposed to happen. It broke my heart, because she obviously still loves him and wants him back. Right. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So then my question to you is, why didn't she say his name? Because I think that that was the final trigger where, you know, he's supposed to say his name because it's buried in there. But I mean, like, I'm sure that if she had said his name, Volk, then that would have helped push him over. I don't think that would trigger it. I think that might know. push him further away as, as more of he's mm-hmm. seeing yeah. this as being uh, someone has wiped his mind and, and is put these cling on things in there is instead of the other way around the way it is there's I human agree. things in there i agree i think it, i think he, he, he um she was trying to pull it up out of him and if she told it to him then she would be like you know um she'd be like forcing it back down yeah i totally agree okay could be. I'm not sure. I I, I love that that they called it the Manchurian test or whatever it was. Yes. Manchurian, yeah, like the awesome. Manchurian candidate. Yeah. But one of the main things that we need to discuss about this, and I'm hoping you guys can help me out here, is so there's a lot of fan reaction to this reveal. Mm-hmm. So with him actually having been Voke, does this lessen the fact that now he probably hasn't been sexually assaulted. So in last week's episode, I made the prediction that I'm like, okay, so the way that the image was shown, and again, I go back to Heather Barker's tweet because, you know, that's my, that's my crutch for this is that when I saw this first time, his flashback, I'm like, that doesn't look like she's abusing him. We're supposed to think that clearly, but it doesn't look that way. And so now we can go and we can look at this and say, okay, this is just jumbled memories and they were falling in love and this is images of them, but he's, he's putting himself on his memories and he's misunderstanding his memories. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of lashback from the fans right now online because this lessens it. So now we've had, how do I word this properly? We've had a good representation of a sexual assault and its effects on a character on screen. That's something that Star Trek hasn't done very well over the years and now they've taken that away or have they what do you guys think about that i was wondering the same thing i'm not exactly sure how you know what i think of it i think in a way the fact that we we went through that and it was real for him at the time i think still was you know it was a strong episode and and i think it was a self-contained episode and people could take something from that and then the fact that it turns out that it's not exactly true um, doesn't necessarily take away from it. And in a sense, it still is true for him because there's, mm-hmm. there's like two people there. There's the person that he is when he's Tyler and there's the person that he is when he was Valk. And the person that he is when he's Tyler does feel like he was sexually assaulted, has, you know, PTSD and, you know, struggled through all of this. And that was all real for him. And so even though sort of technically it wasn't assault because at the time, you know, it was voluntary and consensual, um, doesn't necessarily change that trauma that he went through. So I think kind of it still stands. What do you think, Suzanne? The trauma still stays with him. And it's clear he's still trying to process it. And it will always be with him. What what if he becomes Vogue again? He'll still have Tyler's memories. Okay. Will he? So if yeah, I don't, I don't know. We're completely speculating here, right? <laughs> like it could be gone. I mean, he he's gonna need to keep his memories somehow because let's pretend he's on a spy mission here, mm-hmm. and you know they're gonna they can't just wipe his memory because they'll need him to relay the information that he's found out about the ship, right? Right. So, but but I think that's the that's the confusing thing about this scene now, right? And I can I can see what people are saying online in that. It kind of feels like they've taken something away from this character now, because now the information that we've been given is is distorted through this lens, right? So Voke clearly voluntarily undertook the mission to become Ash Tyler, right? If we go back to episode four when they're talking in the Shenzhou, 
You know, he cl- he clearly voluntarily did this. He's like, you got to give up everything. He's like, okay, basically, let's do this. I mean, yes, we didn't see it happen, but I'm just I'm making an assumption here. And so, if he voluntarily did that, and on their long trip, they fell in love. They, you know, they had sex. They had a good time. And now they make him a human, and it's like, hey, I remember this thing, but you know what? I'm not liking a Klingon. It's it's confusing. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that I think it's kind of a valid point. But I still think that if when he's looking back at it as Tyler, it his experience of it was salt, then he still he still struggled through that. I don't think he was faking that. So you know, and and that episode still you know it was meaningful for people who went through it, and I don't think it necessarily takes away from that that afterwards. Do you know what I mean? As a standalone episode, as something that is mm-hmm. important for people who also went through something, you know, I think they can still connect to what he was going through and struggling through with the PTSD and the assault. And, you know, and so I think that still kind of stands. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. It's powerful. But I mean, like, I don't know. I love it. I loved the reveal. I thought the reveal was amazing. And even though I was expecting it, it still so worked for me. I just, I love listening to this Klingon voice. And I love that that's how they chose to reveal it. Mm-hmm. It was like, I, I totally gave me chills running up and down my spine. Okay, let's move on to Culber then. So here's another example of some lashback that we've got on social media right now. And people are pretty upset. Mm-hmm. Now, what people are upset about is now I haven't watched After Trek, okay? But I was I was texting with Mike Schindler, and uh, he has seen it, and he messaged me a, a couple of points that were said. Mm-hmm. And now I'm not I'm not up on my terms. I'm learning as I go along here. Like I'm like a I'm a learning person about all these terms. And there's a term out there called bury your gaze. Yes. Where, and it's basically, I, I, and I, I've never paid attention to these things. Like, I don't notice these things. So when I hear these terms, I'm like, there's a term for that? Like this, I, I don't notice these things enough that it's like, okay, well, it, if there's a term for it, it's clearly something that's happening frequently enough mm-hmm. that people have made a term. Now, the one thing that I saw when, when Culber got his neck broken is that because I've heard the term so many times now, the first term I thought of is, is uh, refrigerating. Right, I'm like, because here they are. They've just killed Stamets's lover. Like, you know, in most cases, like it's the woman, like the wife or whatever. But in this case, it's his. I don't know if they're married or not. Boyfriend, husband. Um, but here they go. They've, they've. We've got a gay couple. We've got our first gay representation on Star Trek, and they kill one of them. Now, I'm not going to get into speculation of what's been said on social media by what may be happening in the future. We're just going to deal with this episode right now because I think this is an important topic to talk about. So, Guinevere, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, that was ex- <clears throat> that was exactly what I was thinking is, you know, that this is our first gay couple and one of them is, Stamets, is, you know, in, you know, not very good health. Then, you know, suddenly his boyfriend gets killed, boyfriend, husband, whatever. Very suddenly, a character who we totally love, who is really smart, really good character. I mean, just in this episode, he said something because uh, I guess Tyler got upset about um what was it he said um you're not you as far as i'm concerned you're not you (laughs) yeah yeah because because tyler said something about it um i'm not i'm not imagining things and and he replies and it was just it was so beautiful he said i I don't mean it in a um, pejorative way i mean it just that you know you have to imagine things you know if they haven't existed yet so i mean he's just this eloquent beautiful um non-white and gay, strong character who's a doctor, and then boom, he gets killed. And mm-hmm. so it, it was just shocking. And that's why I think I do hope that, you know, somehow we get him back. And I don't know how. And I haven't read any online speculation about it. But I mean, I don't know. I haven't heard, um, I haven't read what you read online. Um, what are people saying well, about it? I haven't read um, any, I'm just, I haven't read anything as to what may be happening. All I've seen no, is. No, about the criticism I meant. Um, the, is, oh, sorry. Is just, just the general criticism where, where a couple people have said, you know, like if you just look at this episode one at a time and, and forgive me, I don't know the actor's name off the top of my head here. Do you know his name? Wilson Cruz. That plays uh, Wilson Cruz. Thank you. Uh, Wilson Cruz is like, look, you got to look at this as a chapter and there's more to come. Stay mm-hmm. with us okay. is what he's saying online. He's saying, stay with us. And some, I did see a tweet that somebody had sent to him and it, and it said, look, 
I understand that you want us to stay with you, but look at this from a one episode point of view. You've got you've got a youth at home who's questioning their sexuality and they're watching a show and they've got this wonderful representation on TV and they're seeing them evolve as a couple and then oh look they just killed off the gay minority again. Mm. Right? So, again, there's no place for me in the future. Now, I, I can't understand that 100%. I can't understand that completely. Right? I'm struggling to try and understand and, and see these things. But I, I see what people are saying when they're talking about it. And I understand that there's more to come. I understand that there's five more episodes in the season. And I don't know. It's just it's it's weird because... While I understand, I hope I, I hope I can say this right. While I understand that it's just a chapter in this book, I do question the logic of writing the death of this gay character right now at this time mm, in history. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because it's so hard to fight for the rights of people right now, and we've struggled so long to get this representation on the screen, why even make that choice? to yeah. kill off that character, yeah. even if they're going to bring it back. Yeah, when well, the rights are being given and then threatened to be taken away again, which is what's happening in this country, unfortunately. Just to put another perspective out there, um, in a way, because we had so fallen for this character, I think, and like I said, he's so eloquent, he's so beautiful, he has so many like wonderful moments where, you know, compassionate moments, eloquent moments, beautiful, you know, just he's a beautiful character the shock of the sudden death the sudden murder of this character in a way like um it kind of can shine a light on you know how much we do love and care about this character who is a gay minority so in a sense mm -hmm. like you know it brings that out and it reminds people that we love this gay minority we all love this gay minority you know what i mean and so it kind of yeah. and then i hope that we do get him back because we also want him to be to continue to be this character that we love going forward um so if we can kind of you know have our cake and eat it too um i could understand why they might do that you know in a sense like in a positive sense if that makes any sense well, right, there right, right. was a lot said on after trek about what's going to happen. Right. Which, Which again, I like, I don't know that I really want to know because again, I like all, I try and stay away from the news and I don't watch after track. The only thing I treat myself to, and I was talking with Christopher Jones about this. The only thing I do is I watch that little 30 second clip. What's next week. And I really try and stay away from as many spoilers as possible. And it is hard in this day and age, especially after something like this, where everybody seems to be talking about this particular thing, you know, like we, we, in another fandom of mine, I was really upset with the season premiere of the X-Files right now because of a lot of weird decisions that were made. Yes. And for people who have seen it, we're not going to spoil it because, you know, I'm not going to spoil it here, but there's something that's revealed at the end. And I'm like, oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> I think that's the greatest. That's awesome. That's a great twist. And then all of a sudden I see what people and how they interpret that. And I'm like, okay, well, I didn't think of that. And that's another thing that I didn't think about. Now, we're not going to get in the X-Files. This is not an X-Files podcast. <laughs> if you want an X-Files podcast, go check out Tony Black's podcast called The X-Cast, which is a great podcast about the X-Files. And they'll talk all about it. But it's just it's it's bringing awareness to me as well that these are things that are tropes in in television and movies and writing in general and mm -hmm. how we can kind of brush over them over time, you know? And while I understand that people are going to die in this show and I understand that people are going to die that I don't want to die in this mm -hmm. show, I just, I question the logic of killing that person. Now, recently there's also been, there was some blowback because they're like, okay, look, we had Georgiou die and we had the security officer, which I can't remember her name, die. So basically the first two major people that died on the show were women of color. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, that was an accident. And then here we go. The next major person that we have die is another minority, right? And I know that the people that are writing the show are women and women of color and people of color, mm -hmm. you know, like there. So I wonder... And my thoughts are like, well, does it, I don't know. I guess I'm just going to say it right. Does it make it right 
because the minority people are writing the deaths of these minority people. That's the question that I have in my head. I don't know if that's the right way to word the question. And I really hope people understand what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to be provocative and I'm not trying to upset people. I'm just like, we've got a whole bunch of minority people writing this show and they're writing the deaths of minority people. Does that make it different? Cause I don't have the answer to that. What do you girls think? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I think that, um, they're not just sidekicks. You know, it's, I think the the old trope, the old thing that was really frustrating was when you would have like a hero white male character and then his sidekick, a black male character, and then he would, the sidekick would like sacrifice his own life to save the white guy, the hero. And, and that was something that just happened again and again and again in movies in the 80s and 90s. And it was really – and before. And it was really mm-hmm. frustrating and, and awful, um, really, when you once you noticed it, you know. But this is not that. And so I'm not saying that it's not still upsetting um, if we see, you know, minority characters getting killed off. Um, but I don't think it's the same thing. And, um, and I don't know whether it matters who's writing it because I, you could always have some people say, well, you know, even if it's a minority person doing it, if they're doing it under pressure of whatever, or, you know, and so they're betraying, you know, what should be done. And I don't want to get into, you know, I'm going to start sounding like, you know, I, 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 there's a fine line there, you know, if I, cause I'm white, you know, for me to, to say, you know, to speak, um, about those kinds of things, but um, I don't think it is like a trope thing, and I I think that we fell in love with this character, and as I say, I hope that we can have our cake and eat it too. I hope that he comes back somehow. Yeah, like I haven't I haven't reacted this way over a character's death since Ned Stark at the end of season one again. <gasps> right? Oh, yeah. don't pick like, the scab. <laughs> oh, it still my, hurts. I tur- my wife and I turned to each other when 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 Tyler broke his neck and we're like, they did not just do that. Like we both said the exact same thing at the exact same time. Like that is, I don't know. I, we, we, I have not reacted that way to a death since Ned Stark at the end of game of Thrones. Yeah. I had to pause and, and, and cry for a bit. Yeah. Like it was, was bonkers. Not, it was, it yeah. was completely unexpected. And so afterwards though, and seeing the, the reaction on social media, my initial thought was, well, what could they have done differently? And my only thought was when Lorca took him off of Stamets as the doctor, he says, you're not able to to take care of him anymore. They replace him with whoever that actual doctor is. Because don't forget, Culber is not the chief medical officer. Yeah, where's the other guy like, hanging out? We never doctor. see him. Yeah. They, they th- I got the impression that the chief medical officer is that guy that was at the space whale in the mud episode, <laughs> okay. right? Yeah. So the only other thing the I could have thought is like, okay, so they bring him on to take care of the person, to take care of uh, Tyler and Stamets, and then Tyler kills him. Mm. But then I'm like, well, then it has no impact. Right. Mm-hmm. So and then it doesn't play into know. the long game. Right. So then do they just not kill anybody? Because then again, if they bring him back, does that complete? negate the death i don't know oh oh it's so crazy it's so bad <laughs> yeah well again i would say that it doesn't necessarily negate i think that is you know you have the impact and that episode is kind of self-contained and you have the impact of going through someone's ptsd or um their their sexual assault and you have the impact of the death and and we feel it and we remember how much we love him and we're shocked and you know we have that impact and then if he's brought back Especially, you know, maybe if he's not brought back straight away, but, you know, it takes an episode or the end of the next episode or or an episode down the line, we've felt the loss and then somehow we get him back. And then I don't think it's negated at all. And I think we've gone through it. And then and that's what I mean about like the having our cake and eating it, too, because we have felt the loss and we, you know, so it really highlights how much we love this character. And then we get him back so that we still have him going forward. And Voyager's actually d- done that a few times. Go back 20 years. Like 900 times with Harry Kim. Exactly. But the most, the person that was killed the most was Captain Janeway. That's Yet, correct, yes. Like a cockroach, she's always coming back. And I love my Captain Janeway. I can say that. <laughs> but you, you know, they would always find something, whether it be Borg nanoprobes, grabbing uh, uh, another Harry Kim from another mirror ship, if you will with Naomi Wildman, who also died in the same episode. 
Star Trek finds a way to bring those characters back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it traditionally so fear does, not. but fear Discovery not. seems a little different in that way. So I, I just, I hope that they do that again. <laughs> mm-hmm. We'll see what happens. It, it, very, a very shocking event, a very shocking moment. I think like, honestly, for Star Trek, this is the most shocking moment mm-hmm. since the death of baby Naomi Wildman for me. <laughs> like Deadlock is my favorite episode of Voyager, right? And I could not believe that they killed the baby back in 1995 like that completely blew my mind okay star trek does not have a lot of really shocking moments like this so i don't know i appreciate that because i was it came out of left field and it happened fast and i mean i will say it like uh, this this is probably my favorite episode of the series so far i loved every second of this episode mine too you know and you know like it, uh, so it's 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 fascinating to be having these controversial topics to talk about uh, over an episode that we loved so much. Uh, anything else you want to talk about with Culber here? Not without going into other things that I've heard. Tears. <laughs> well, you better stop. T- you better start talking more, or I'm gonna cut your tongue off and lick my boots with it, Suzanne. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Captain Tilly, amazing. Let's talk about Tilly. I have gotta, I have a new amazing. cosplay that I need to work on now. I need to be Taryn Captain Tilly. I, I was I was again I was messaging Christopher Jones on this, and because the episode was moving so fast, I did not see this coming. I don't know why I didn't see this coming, but when they revealed her on screen, I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I'm like, of course, of course. But I did not I did not see it coming. And even when when Burnham was there, we're like, we got to find out because it's not you. I'm like, well, who could it be? It's mm-hmm. got to be Burnham, right? It's got to be Burnham. So I don't did did I, I either did of you it. predict this? I, I totally saw it coming because because uh, Stamets oh, yeah. calling her captain before he called her captain. I, mm-hmm. I know I saw that I called it out so many times in that episode. I'm like, why did he call her captain? And I just I didn't even clue in when I was watching this episode. It was awesome. <laughs> it was. Uh, I mean, the, the whole thing is awesome with Tilly Killy. It's great, Captain Killy. Yeah. <laughs> so. Suzanne, so do you, do you think she? You, so obviously, you think she pulled it off. You think she did a good job of it? Uh, yes, she she had to work her way into it, but once she found her footing, she definitely took on that character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was awesome. She was. I, I mean, she is awesome. Tilly is is awesome. The way that she was so nervous, and even after she like she did her great performance as as Captain Killy, and then the view screen goes off, and she just the look at on her face when she's like, <laughs> <laughs> so she couldn't believe that she had pulled it off, and she was so relieved. And and I and it's gonna be interesting seeing in the next episode like how she takes it on the the little teaser for the next episode about. Um, you know, can we can we hold on to our humanity and who we are if we stay in this universe for very long? Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to affect Tilly, probably, but it does make you, you know, it gives you something to think about, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. When I when I see this episode, especially, like I really think a lot of um, the episode. I think it's the nth degree from the Next Generation with Barkley, and you know, like I'm not a big fan of Barkley himself as a character because I'm uncomfortable when I'm watching him, right? Because he's stuttering and, and the way that he speaks and the way that he acts and how nervous he is, I'm uncomfortable watching Barkley. And when I watch the episode, the nth degree, I forget how amazing an actor Dwight Schultz is Mm -hmm. because he is so different than Barkley in that episode. Right. And that's what I saw here. You know, like I, I, I've never felt uncomfortable watching Tilly. And, you know, Tilly is probably... Saru and Tilly are my two favorite characters on the show. Um, but just watching her transformation on the screen and to see that confidence projected on her... like we Again, yeah, we've seen that confidence back in episode three when they go over to the other ship, right? And she's like, mm-hmm. you in the shadows, step out. Like So she has that ability <laughs> as a person. But to see her as an, act, as an actor portraying this... Captain Killy was a wonderful transformation. And like, she's an amazing actress. It's wonderful. Agreed. Definitely. Agreed. I mean, I think everyone came into their own in this episode as well. I mean, I think the whole series came into its own really. I mean, it, 
you know, I think, you know, a lot of people thought it already was there. But for me, this is really when Discovery came into its own and when so many characters came into their own. And, you know, and then horrifically, obviously, we lose one of them at the same time. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent, right on. Um, okay, so we'll talk last about Jonathan Frakes. Before we move on to that topic, though, are there any other plot elements or character elements that happen in this episode that you guys would like to discuss? Anything that I've missed or overlooked? Uh, one thing that struck me, um, Saru's threat ganglia came out, and that was exactly right. as Tyler was walking on the bridge. Was that due to Tyler, or was that due to the the Vulcan renegade rebel ship? I think it was due to Tyler, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was something I want to talk about that I forgot about. And this, one of the things about Star Trek Discovery is things are happening very quickly on this show. Like, we're expecting certain things to happen over a certain amount of time based on how TV's produced nowadays, but things aren't really happening in that time frame. And the, the example that I want to use is the, um, the uh, Tardigrade. I thought that was going to be like, the season, right? And then, mm-hmm. like, one episode we got the Tardigrade, the next episode the Tardigrade's gone. And it's I like, miss oh, him. okay. I miss He's him. He's, like, gone really quickly. <laughs> but, so here we are with Volk, or, sorry, Tyler, and, <laughs> I mean, he's been strong and confident up until the last episode, and then now his character has drastically chained, changed. Now, I'm not familiar with PTSD, Right. But he's really changed. He's late. You know, like, yes, he's, he, I understand. Yes, he is having blackouts and stuff now Mm -hmm. and things are breaking down quickly, but it's just, it's just, it's odd at how quickly it's progressing and how quickly the story progressed in this episode is what I'm trying to say. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, um, that one other thing is what about, um, Tyler and Burnham? And, you know, the way that he, you know, he did, like, like you say, he was, he's changing. Like, he's obviously, struggling with you know the blackouts of of being Vogue or or whatever um but then he the way that he said to to burnham he said um you know but i'm here you know my purpose is to is to protect you and he looked so kind of like weak and shriveled and you know Mm -hmm. i feel like you know that he knows that you know he is because he's learned you know from the doctor even whatever amount he blacked out he knows that something happened there he learned something was wrong with him i think he's got to retain some part of that memory and so he knows that she's going to find that out soon even if he doesn't remember the murder he still must remember like you know some some part of that and he's kind of he's this shriveled you know part of himself and and but saying i'm here to protect you and and he believes that i think he really wants to to be there for her and he still loves her and that's tragic isn't it mhm but in turn in turn she also said that she's there to protect him right so it was kind of a give and take and she sees that he's he's breaking he's there's something really really wrong and he just won't tell her, and she's going to find out. Well, we also had that scene when Lorca walked up to Burnham on the bridge, and he's like, look, I need to know that I can trust my crew. Can I trust you? And the subtext that I read on that is he's like, what do you know about what's going on with Tyler? Like, that's Mm -hmm. the subtext that I read about him asking her that question. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad that I'm not the only one that caught that. That's the subtext that they caught off of it. So that's good. Uh, Anywho, so let's, let's end the discussion here with Jonathan Frakes. So... Here we go. Jonathan Frakes, Commander Riker himself, directing this. The man that directed uh, Star Trek First Contact. Everybody's, except for mine, favorite Star Trek The Next Generation movie. Mine's Generations. I love Generations. I love Generations. First Contact is definitely my favorite. Pardon me? I said First Contact is definitely my favorite. But Generations (laughs) is good too. It's very good. Knowing this as a person who has directed our most people's favorite film in the the Next Generation franchise... um, do you see much difference in the direction of this episode as to what we've seen previous or does it feel pretty standard? I wish Mike was here to talk about this. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not good at picking apart directors. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, so one interesting shot that I noticed that really stood out to me was when they were in Lorca's room right at the beginning and they were looking at that map and the camera was like, Going around and around mm-hmm. and around them, right? It was going around really rapidly. And that's something that I I haven't noticed anything like that prior to this on 
on discovery. So I thought that was really cool. And then I wonder what type of decisions can be made that are a writing decision and a directing decision. Like what my favorite part in the whole episode was when Burnham is fighting with that guy in the elevator and she kicks that power thing out and the, and the, the thing stops <gasps> so suddenly yeah, that, was so that cool. like they shoot up because of the inertia. And I'm like, that is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Now is that, that's phrased. I don't know. Is that a writing edition or is that a phrase? I, I bet you that's phrase. You think that might be phrase? Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, that, no that felt like a callback to me to earlier, um, Star Trek. You know, like TNG era kind of stuff, that feeling. It feels like something that Frakes, you know, being from that era would make sure was part of that. So, I, I mean, I'm just guessing, but I would, my, my money's on that's Frakes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Well, he definitely knows his uh, turbo lift yeah. scenes because <laughs> Next Generation had tons yep. and tons of turbo lift scenes. So, anywho, uh, excellent. Ladies, any final thoughts that you have on this episode? Guinevere, we'll start with you. Um, just really that I think it's it's really come into its own. It's very dramatic, and you know it really has me. I'm really caught up. I'm really excited for the next episode more so than I was before. And even though we like you know we all have said that, and you know obviously the internet is part of this, but we've all said that you know we had some idea of what was going to happen with the unfolding of these developments, these plot, even so there, every part of it is exciting. It's deeper than what we have guessed. You know, it's just, it's a rich show and I think it's really come into its own now. Mm-hmm. Suzanne, any final thoughts? I'm just really looking forward to uh, what's coming next and the little tidbits that were given during after Trek. I am, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So since you guys haven't seen it, I'm not going to say anything. Yes. The only thing that I'm going to say, so I'm going to talk a little bit. So for those that don't want to know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the previously or next time on, on discovery here. And a couple of things that I saw that are really cool. So, um, the 30 second clip for next time with discovery, they show an Andorian. Uh-huh. So I'm super excited wow. to see Andorian. There's an Andorian like walking behind and they show him from behind and below. I'm really excited for that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, everybody was freaking out because they saw Sarek with a beard <laughs> and, you know, I, I watched that again this morning and I took a couple of screenshots and I posted them on Twitter. And I'm like, the thing that I'm excited about is when Sarek is there. And if you want to go back and look at it, you can see it. Um, Sarek is like doing some kind of mind meld on Burnham. Mm-hmm. And in the background, out of focus, sitting at what looks like the head of the table for these rebels is Voke. Oh, what? Wow. Right? Like he's like, yes, he's like out of focus. So like the Klingon of the mirror universe looks to be the rebel leader, right? And they show Tyler fighting with a Klingon. And I'm like, that looks like Vogue to me. So it looks like in the next episode, Tyler's going to be fighting Vogue with a bat left. (laughs) That is so. I will have to go check that out. Yeah, if you check my Twitter feed, you can check it out. I posted them today. Uh, it's, it's it's Monday today as we record this here. But uh, I am really excited. That's the only they're not even really spoilers because it's like pre- next time on Star Trek. And and uh, I like watching those because it's just a little bit more that we get for the next episode. So I could be wrong, but I mean, that's what I look, that's what I see when I look at those images. That's, that's what it looks like. They're all out of focus, but that's kind of what I see. I could just be wishing here, but <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just, out. my mind was right on Sarek the entire time. I was like, ah. he looked so much like, <laughs> I know, like I mirror Spock. Like, I was like, everybody's- oh my God, it's crazy. <laughs> But it is all that's about the... That's what I tweeted. The- I'm like, everybody's freaking yeah. out about Spock's beard. And I'm like, is that Vogue in the back? <laughs> so. But it is all about so. putting in those little Easter eggs these days, isn't it? When when they have yeah, the, like, next yeah. time. So I bet you're right. Guinevere, where can people find you online? And tell us about the Briar Patch a bit. Okay, well, the Briar Patch is a socioeconomics uh, podcast. Uh, kind of, you know, looking for the socioeconomic kind of... Um, lessons and stories and and things that you find in star trek so we kind of deep analyze some episodes and we talk about the kind of star trek universe as a whole from that kind of perspective and try to have fun with it despite it being the dismal science (laughs) um and i'm on uh facebook a lot and uh occasionally around the rest of um the trek fm universe and uh, i occasionally tweet under guinevere 42 uh that's about it Suzanne, where can people find you when you're not, uh, I don't know, crying over the death of Culber? I couldn't think of anything. (laughs) 
Well, you can find me popping up every now and again in the Babel Conference. You can also find me on Twitter. My handle is KJaneway8. And you can find me on the Trek FM Network, co-hosting To The Journey with Kay Shaw and Zachary Fruling. And this week we're going to be talking about my favorite leather-clad gentleman, Chicote. <laughs> mm, excellent. Well... Talking about Klingon, human, whatever you might call it, is not the only thing we're discussing here on the network this week. Actually, pretty much it is. <laughs> but take a listen to this clip and see what else you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, Warp 5. You don't want to give up what makes you human or makes you moral or good just to save the, the structure and the trappings and, and even your own lives. And that kind of thing. So, and that is the real dilemma. And ultimately, Archer has to answer that for himself, whether he really is giving up his humanity. And Earl Grey. Did you even pick up a piece of trash? Yes. (laughs) You know, and so just that story of you accomplished this, you know, and that your ancestor that did this. And so don't throw it away and just give it to her because those are your works and your successes and your contributions. To the journey! I do feel the need to supply the missing melody since we're not actually listening to it. We're just watching it with no sound. <laughs> 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 Bring us home, Kay. Bring us home. Back to the Alpha Quadrant. Back to the Alpha Quadrant. Yeah, we've got it, got it. <laughs> the Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. See, I, I would love that. I would love to have a scene where Volk and Tyler meet. Like, and I would, I would be just fine with that. I don't, I don't need this to be the the thing. And honestly, like when I watched Choose Your Pain the first time, I didn't. I what I watched the episode. I didn't. I didn't think for a second he would have been Volk. I didn't think of that at all. Mm-hmm. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. So check out all these shows and join in the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond into the mirror universe. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, please be sure to hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. That helps other people find our show. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 files from our website or grab the RSS link as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose send to a show and select The Edge. That will come right to us. You can also find us on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brandon Metella, and you can find me over on Warp 5, hosting new episodes with my new co-hosts. Floyd has left, but joining us uh, for the next episode is going to be Patrick Devlin and Brandy Jacola. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, be sure to check that out. You can find me over on the Fandom Podcast Network with my friends Chris and Tom. We will be the hosts of a show called Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast, which is a lot of fun. So be sure to check those things out. If you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trek.fm. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash trek.fm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. Available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trek.fm. At this time, we'd like to thank our wonderful, wonderful, wonderfully evil Mirror Universe supporters of Trek FM and The Edge. Our patrons are the evil Norman C. Lau, the malicious 
Tony Robinson, the delicious Thomas Puleo, the evil Captain Killy Lisa Slack, the, I'm running out of adjectives here, the uh, horrible Shoab Mirza, the insane Richard Rutledge, and the spooky James Muldrow. Don't take offense to any of it, I'm just trying to come up with weird words. Thank you guys for supporting the show, we really appreciate it, and uh, we couldn't do it without you, that's for sure. So, uh, that's all we got for you today, I guess, so please be sure to join us next week and find out what we're doing on The Edge. Mm-hmm.